All right, so now part two of this kind of two lecture set. Everything in the previous lecture you had seen before in some way, perhaps with some additional sophistication kind of thrown onto it, uh, that I think we're ready for and will need, I think, in order to aid us in some understanding. Because I think it's worth kind of reviewing what exactly potential energy was um, in terms of energies as we think about now this thing called potential. Even, you know, even with that, I'm still now going to work through kind of another example of how we might define this thing called potential using gravity. Um, so again, like in the previous lecture where I said I will only highlight things that are generally true, I might not highlight you know, stuff uh, for a while. But again, I think this example will help motivate a conceptual understanding about what potential is, which is not potential energy, though related, perhaps unsurprisingly. So let's bring back what we have in the previous video. A force is a conservative force, um, means that it allows us to define this thing called potential energy. So again, let's take a constant gravitational force, force where the, the force vector is a constant and points downward. I will use a coordinate system where up is positive, which means I can then define this force as negative mg in the y direction. I'm going to write that also as m times a vector g. Uh, which you could think of this as the acceleration field if you wanted to. Um, it's something that is in, essentially this G is what results from the Earth. Earth pulling on the object results in this G. And then when I put, you know, a ping pong ball or a bowling ball or myself, all which have different masses, that then translates into a force. It's a conservative force. So again, we define potential energy as negative as this negative work integral where you're integrating from some reference point to some arbitrary point of interest. So again, in that case, we could write it as mgy. And technically, um, whenever you write a potential energy function, you should also state kind of what the reference point is. Um, but if you don't, not the end of the day, remembering the key idea that it's only changes in potential energy that have any physical meaning, because that relates to work. And then if you want to get the force back, uh, you take negative what we call the gradient of the potential energy function, which is just the partial derivatives uh, for each dimension. So again, if I take this and take the partial with respect to x, which means I treat everything here as a constant, and there's no, no x, so the derivative of a constant is 0, same thing with z. So there is a y here, so when I treat m and g like a constant and take the derivative with respect to y, uh, that's mg. And then there's this negative sign that the gang gets thrown in. And so then if, for example, let's see, this one, this picture is going to ultimately be used for a couple things. So let's make it big. So if, for example, I have a ball um, that if I say it has a potential energy of 20 joules at this location, and then define and I define u equals zero to be when y equals zero, I could do kind of my first energy example um, if the ball, and let's say it's two kilograms. Uh, is released from rest with a potential energy of 20 joules. How fast is it moving when u equals zero? So again, with energy problems, you have some start point, you have some end point, the ball somehow makes it to the ground, doesn't necessarily have to follow a straight line, uh, but 
because again, remember, it doesn't matter the path. Um, I guess I didn't technically say that last time. I just said that any closed path does zero work. A corollary of that is that you can show that if you have two endpoints, a start and an endpoint that are not the same point, essentially you could take any, any path that gets from point A to point B does the same amount of work. It's not too hard to prove because if a loop is zero, then that means one, ha one part of the loop going from A to B better be negative the, the part that goes from B to A. So then you flip the direction and essentially I could draw two completely different paths, but they have to do the same amount of work between two points. But if I just release this from rest in the air, we know the path is going to be straight down. So how fast is it moving when u equals zero? So if I want to be, so this is a conservation problem uh, where if I, but again, let's, to make sure we are understanding work, let's try to, let's write this out more explicitly. So I know that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the net work done. I know that the work done by the gravitational force can be written as negative delta u gravity. So if delta ke final minus initial, it starts from rest, so it looks like that's just one half mv final squared minus zero, and then delta u is final minus initial, so it looks like it's zero minus uh, 20 joules. Again, the minus is in the definition, not that the potential energy is negative. So it looks like the potential energy decreased by 20 joules. Then that seems like 1 half mv squared equals negative, and then we said this was negative 20 joules, or this is then just 20 joules. Or it looks like V, M I said is 2 conveniently, so then it looks like V is uh, plus or minus the square root of 20. And I'm dividing by M, so um, that gets rid of the kilogram, the joule then just becomes meter per second squared, the square root then turns into just meter per second. And so then this looks like it's, uh, let's see, it's greater than 16, so the square root of 16 is 4, but it's less than 25, so the square root of 25 is 5, um, so this ends up being about 4.5 meters per second. Right, again, work, the, the gravitational force did work on the object, for some, and since it was positive work, it caused it to speed up. So, so in this case, right, again, with kind of the anchor here is to think that, you know, positive work speeds up. But then what happened, if I want to think of this in terms of potential energy, uh, it looks like in this case, negative potential energy caused the thing to speed up. Uh, how do you have a net or negative, sorry, negative change in potential energy caused the thing to speed up? You started at 20, you ended up at zero, final minus initial, zero minus 20, negative 20. Potential energy went down. Uh, so a potential energy that's negative uh, seems like that ended up being speeding up. Again, the savings in the bank went down so that you could then cash out as kinetic energy, to use the analogy from last, you know, previous semester's videos. So in this case, it seems like if we want to think of going from low to high or high to low, as you go from u high to u low, that, that'd be a way of explaining this, uh, you speed up, right? I went from 20 to zero, it decreased. If the floor wasn't there, right, the ball would have kept falling down. Uh, I could still say, even if there is no ground, when, you know, when the ball eventually gets to the point where y equals zero, how fast is it moving? It would be 4.5 meters per second. But then if it just kept falling, I could then say, you know, what happens when it has a potential energy of negative 20 joules? You know, when it falls kind of symmetrically below y equals zero. And there's nothing wrong with potential energies being negative. Because again, it's the difference that matters. As you go from what, you know, 
u equals 0 to u equals negative 20, um, final minus initial, that's still a delta u of negative 20, which then results in a positive work of 20 joules by these definitions. So, right, that's one kind of very simple example. But now let's think about what this potential energy has, right? This potential energy has the mass of the object. So if I drop a bowling ball versus a ping pong ball, I have to plug in a different mass for that. And then it also has this component that I'm calling that vector G, that that part really has nothing to do with the object that I'm dropping. It only has to do with the earth. That is the force, that is the, you know, the acceleration field uh, that the earth is creating around the area so that when you drop the ball, ping pong, bowling, or otherwise, um, that then is what causes the thing to start accelerating and get moving. So, I'll just redraw the axes. So, you can imagine uh, maybe I'll just write that out explicitly. Gravitational potential energy has a mass m, which is the object experiencing the force, um, along with this vector G, well, it's not a vector, so let me be careful. Um, uh, also, uh, the kind of G times Y component, or term, or f sorry, factor. Right, because it's M times G Y. So the mass M is kind of the object experiencing force. And there's also this G Y, which might connect to, right, relates to uh, the object providing the force. Maybe I'll, instead of object, I'll, really, I'll say relates to the agent providing the force. So there's no confusion. In this case, the agent is the Earth. The agent that's providing the force, the Earth, right, the, the acceleration that we're feeling from the Earth does not, again, does not matter if it's a ping pong ball or a bowling ball. They both are feeling an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. If I jump off a roof, I feel an acceleration of negative 9.8 meters squared on my body. Um, right, so there's, you know, but if I wanted to talk about the potential energy of a bowling ball, a ping pong ball, me, they have different values. Uh, you know, if I define zero to be uh, the ground, and then, uh, you know, and then I have a bowling ball, a ping pong ball, and myself one meter off the ground, right? My potential energy is my mass times G times one meter. The bowling ball is the bowling ball's mass times G times one meter. The ping pong ball is the ping pong's mass times G times one meter. Those are going to be, go from high, medium, low in terms of the actual numbers. We all have different potential energies at, you know, one meter off the ground. And so then when we all go from one meter and fall to the, to the ground, zero meters, uh, we all have a different change in potential energy. So a motivator here is, um, or what I would like to think as kind of a motivation here, a motivation for potential Um, is going to be is is to is it possible for us to take this potential energy function and separate it into a part that really only depends on the object experiencing the force and then a part that only depends really on the object the agent creating the force All right so motivating for potential is want to uh, separate the object and the agent. Because again, without knowing the problem I'm trying to solve in advance, I might want to say something about what Earth is doing in this vicinity, right? And then when I eventually decide what I'm going to throw, right, I'm going to drop a bowling ball, a ping pong ball, whatnot, 
then I can start plugging in numbers and new potential energies and whatnot. But maybe I could get around that and maybe I can still say something meaningful just by talking about what the, the agent that's creating this force field in this room. So this motivates then, let us define, and again, this definition is gonna end up being different for charges, uh, which so I'm not gonna highlight this, but um, this is how you would define it, uh, say in an astrophysics course or an upper level mechanics course um, uh, for gravity. So let's define the gravitational potential V, maybe a little G on it, as the gravitational potential energy divided by the mass of the object experiencing the force. So in this case of a uniform gravitational field, it's just G times Y. Which again, notice that this is the part that's really only relying, you know, the same thing about the agent, you know, the Earth creating this, this force. But this is a scalar uh, and doesn't depend on if it's a ping pong ball, bowling ball, what have you. So potential is an example of a scalar field just meaning it's defined everywhere in space, like an electric field, but in this case, unlike the electric field, is not a vector, is a scalar. So where the electric field, we could draw a bunch of arrows that gave me directions and magnitudes at all points in space for the electric field, here I can define a potential field where I can just write a single number at every point in space. So going back up to this drawing, I could define locations where the potential is the same value. These are called equipotential surfaces. So for example, if I look at the formula, it just says g times y. Let's say g is 10. Right, so I could define this line here where y equals one meter. And at that point, or, or uh, rather along all those points, that is where v equals 10. Let's, let's round g up to 10, and uh, then I plug in one meter. And again, there are units, of course, associated with it, but they are different than when we do charge, so I'm going to be a little sloppy here. but then and not bother writing its unit. Though it's easy to see, right? It's potential energy divided by mass. Eh, let's just write it then. Uh, so you know, if it's defined as U divided by M, then this is gonna be joules divided by kilograms. Then going back, you know, I could draw this line at Y equals two, where everywhere along that line, V is the same value. V equals 20 everywhere along this line. Again, joules per kilogram. Three, same thing. So then these are called equipotential surfaces. So this is, these are surfaces of constant V, V sub G in this case. And again, defined to be equipotential, equal potential. So you'll see them called equipotential surfaces or equipotentials. Uh, it just means all the locations where there is a certain value for V in this case. And again, this is saying something about the force agent. Now, what are, what's the importance of equipotential surfaces? There are a couple of things that we'll explore uh, today and in the next lectures. But if we, recall, if we recall by our definition that I'm saying that potentials are related to potential energies, they're not the same. I'm running out of room, so I think I'm gonna actually copy all of this to the next page.
you can imagine, again, let's try to connect this to something physical, right? Here, I've essentially just made a definition, which you might say, great, uh, who cares? But let's make sure it connects back to something more physically meaningful. So, um, if we have defined V to be U over M, then that means that the potential energy due to gravity is M times V, the mass times the potential. So sometimes you will also see uh, the potential right, written, right, written as the potential energy over mass or energy per mass, or specific energy is what you might call that. The word uh, specific in physics right, usually means you know, something per something. So specific energy might be energy per mass, or what we'll actually see energy per charge. Uh, but we don't need necessarily jargon for the sake of jargon at this point. So this also then implies, again, since potential energy doesn't mean anything, but changes in potential energy does, this also means that the change in potential energy is equal to the mass times the change in potential. But in this case, since the change in potential energy in the previous part, we said the change in potential energy in general, um, rather the negative of the change in potential energy, relates to the change in kinetic energy. That then implies that the change in kinetic energy is equal to negative the mass times the change in potential. Connecting potential back to something more physically meaningful, like changes in kinetic energy, changes in how fast you're moving. So, in this case, as you change your potential, as you move from a location where you have some value of the potential to some other value of the potential, that is the result, presumably, of a force acting on you, or you're going, or acting against a force, uh, that should then cause you to speed up or slow down. This gives us a way to quantify that changes in your potential, once you multiply it by your mass, essentially, you know, all that is, is the same, if that's a change in your potential energy, uh, and then the negative sign may, means that it is a work, uh, and then that work, of course, connects back to how you change your kinetic energy. So, in this case, uh, changes in potential connect to uh, work being done and again there might be some negative signs and you have to multiply the mass you know overall um, so it connects to the work being done by the the agent once you reintroduce you know the mass of the object that gravity is working on or what, what have you So, if we, for example, go back to the diagram and look at what happens when you hang out on an equipotential surface. So suppose you're hanging out here in the and you're a ball and it gets relocated across the equipotential surface to here. So my starting point is V equals 20. I end at V equals 20. I can ask myself, has the object sped up or slowed down? Well, again, I'm trying to anchor this in something meaningful before we throw charges in in electric fields, which are more abstract. Now, you have a ball on a table, and it gets moved to another side of the table. It's a horizontal table. Has gravity done anything in that case? Which, by anything, will say that, has it done any work on the object that would make it speed up or slow down? I think you would easily say no, right? If I move the ball horizontally across the table, it might speed up or slow down because I'm pushing it, uh, but that's me, that's not gravity. Going horizontally across the table, gravity is not doing any work. If gravity is not doing any work, then the potential energy due to gravity is not changing. But now, again, trying to disconnect the mass of the ball, or it could be I move one of you across a table, uh, or I move you know, my book bag across a table. 
There's no work being done by gravity in any of those cases. And note that that is coinciding with the idea of potential not changing when I go from point A to point B. So we should again be able to relate this to something physical and some, something I can visualize. When do forces do zero work? Well, work, as we'll write it back down, uh, um, since work is defined to be force over a displacement, W equals zero, um, well, I guess I should be careful. Uh, let's, let's not, because then I could speed up and then slow back down and that would still be zero net work. Uh, so let's use the differential form. So since a little bit of work is defined to be a force over a displacement, um, there is no work, which that means you don't speed up or slow down, when, and when is the dot product zero, when f is perpendicular to your displacement. I guess I, I realized I wrote delta r instead of dr. Um, technically I should have wrote dr in these cases. If the force is a constant force, then there's no difference, but I really should have wrote dr. And again, that makes sense, right? Something's moving horizontally, gravity is moving, per you know, is, is pulling perpendicular to that that can't speed something up or down. That might change the direction if the object is able to, uh, but that's not gonna speed up or slow down. So then you might go up here and notice that if I were to draw, um, and I'm not gonna draw the force vector, because again, the force vector, it's m times g. It involves, or it depends on if it's a bowling ball or a pin pong ball or whatever. But I can draw that vector I call g. Right? I defined g on the previous page to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared in the y direction. And notice that if I were to draw that, you know, along, you know, at some point along the equipotential surfaces, is it coincidence that all of these vectors seem to make 90 degree angles with the equipotential surfaces? Turns out, no. That is actually a property of equipotential surfaces. So we can write, um, so along equipotentials, um, F is perpendicular to the potential surface. Again, why is that the case? Uh, because no work is done along a potential. By that agent. That agent can't do work on the object uh, if the object is moving along a potential surface. These potential surfaces are essentially defining locations where if you look perpendicular to the surface, that will give you the direction of the force. But then you might ask, I just go up to this example, I drew these arrows down because we knew what the force was, but if we just use the fact, um, and let's just draw an arbitrary example. I suppose I have, uh, here's my, some box, and maybe there's some curved surfaces that look more like this, maybe. And maybe this is uh, V equals 30, this is V equals 20, and then this is V equals 10. I should have made that bigger. In those cases, can you 
extract from those potentials the direction of the force uh, at every point. So again, that kind of some arbitrary curves. And this is V equals 30, 20, times A. And if you know that the force that's creating, that has this potential energy, that I can then use to define this potential, if I know then that the force is perpendicular at each at each point along the surface, so in this, you know, for this middle surface, all these vectors, all these lines are perpendicular or make a 90 degree angle with the surfaces. But then which way do I draw the arrow on each of these? Do I draw, you know, going from kind of the middle out or from the out in, uh, we still need to figure that out. And again, it makes sense that we should be able to do this. Because again, with the idea of potential energy, we wanted to create a potential energy function where information was not lost. I could do something to the potential energy function to get back the force. So presumably, if I'm drawing these surfaces of constant potential, which you might uh, be able to appreciate if I look at the definition um, here, that surfaces of constant potential are also going to be surfaces of constant potential energy because I just take all the I just take all of these numbers and multiply it by the mass of you know the bowling ball or the ping pong ball or whatnot and then those become surfaces of constant potential energy presumably then of course information about the force is encoded in this potential or in this particular case information about G presumably in the, its direction is presumably encoded in these numbers. So let's think about that. Then I have to think about, um, well, let's, let's, uh, let's do an, ex an example of numbers and then re return to that. So, um, well, let's do kind of the same example. Um, E.g., you have a two kilogram ball um, that goes from V equals 10 joules per kilogram to V equals zero joules per kilogram. Um, and it's released from rest. What is the final speed? And again, let's look back at our picture. Now the picture technically now has some arrows drawn on it. Uh, so maybe that's cheating. Maybe I should redraw it up here and we should ignore that drawing. Okay, so I have some equipotentials that I could draw depending on what values I am interested in. Or perhaps this is V equals zero, this is V equals five, and say this is V equals 10 joules per kilogram. And it seems like the ball starts here and ends here. So we have our starting point and our end point. Again, uh, anchoring ourselves in our intuition about how gravity works, it seems like the ball should speed up you know, as a result of being released from rest above, above the surface. So again, let's use this as a sanity check on, our, on the math, these definitions. And then maybe we can start to say some more general stuff about uh, potential. So again, if delta u is the same thing as m delta v, but then also I know that 
kinetic energy is negative potential energy. So then we wrote down above, the change in kinetic energy equals negative the mass times delta V. The change in kinetic energy starts from rest. It's final velocity we're trying to figure out. So it's 1 half mv squared minus its initial, which was 0. And it's delta V looks like it's 0 joules per kilogram minus its initial, which we said was 10 joules per kilogram. So it looks like the delta V was is ultimately negative 10 joules per kilogram. When it was potential energy, we said that this speeds up, right? You cash out savings, you gain kinetic energy. You went down, and so kinetic energy went up. Looks like this is also the case here, because then it looks like this is 1 half mv squared, the final squared, equals negative m, negative 10 uh, joules per kilogram. Uh, in this case, notice the masses cancel out. I didn't even need to know. The, the mass of the ball. So Galileo is happy. And then this looks like it's V final equals plus or minus. Uh, the negatives cancel as well. So again, it looks like it's plus or minus the square root of 20, which we said before was about 4.5 meters per second. So in this case, it seemed like um, in going from high potential to low potential, V equals 20 to V, or sorry, V equals uh, 10 to V equals 20, um, you gain kinetic energy. You gain kinetic energy when the force acting on you points closer to parallel versus anti-parallel. So if we wanted to try to, from this, extrapolate trends, it seems like uh, you know we drop a ball. It goes from high potential to low potential. Uh, I guess we dropped the ball from rest, um, and that so that when it went from high to low which happened to also be the same thing it did with potential energy, high u to low u, um, it sped up. Uh, so then the force associated with the potential energy must be closer to parallel to the displacement. I don't know, room, displacement. So then it seems if I wanted to define something general, uh, it seems that then uh, the delta V relates to uh, G in this case, um, in that this G vector points from larger V to smaller V. I write v sub g because I know I don't want to confuse it with velocity. So then going back up to this drawing, if it goes from high v to low v, it seems like then I should draw all these arrows pointing in this way. They are always perpendicular to the equipotential surfaces, but then the direction of the arrows should point. Um, in the direction towards lower values of v. For this, in this case, where we've defined potential based on a constant gravitational force, though that ends up being generally true, but I won't highlight it in this section. Okay, we're building something here um, where we can say something now about. You know, the agent in the kind of acceleration field that the agent has created in the case of gravity. Um, what else can we say? Where we had potential energy and we wanted to be able to extract back the force, 
like we defined this potential energy based on a force and we wanted to go the other way where we define where we could get back the force based on the potential energy here we might want to do something similar i can define v in some way and presumably it shouldn't depend on forces it should depend only on the agent and then from that potential i should be able to get back you know the in this case the vector g which relates to something about what the agent is doing so then we can write that down and then i think that will kind of do it for this example trying to emphasize here again that v and u are related but they're not the same thing again just to stick with this kind of bowling ball versus ping pong ball example if I make you lay on the ground with your face looking up and I one meter above the ground drop a ping pong ball onto your face that is going to be very different than if I drop a bowling ball one meter above your face they both are going to go through the same delta V the change in potential is going to be the same for both of them though when I plug in the masses um, of the ping pong ball versus the bowling ball they are going to have a very different change in potential energy as they go from one location to, the, to your face. As a result, they are going to have very different kinetic energies. They'll have the same velocity, the same speeds actually, but you know when you square that and then multiply it by their masses, they will have very different kinetic energies when they finally hit your face, which means your face is going to have to do a different amount of work to stop those balls. Not that much work for the ping pong ball, so then you don't feel that back reaction, Newton's third law, but then a lot for the bowling ball. All right, so how can we get something about the agent from delta V? So if we define delta V as one over M delta U, and again, that's just from expression we did above, so some algebra. But then I know by definition, delta U was negative the work done by that force so that's negative 1 over m, the integral of the force times the displacement, or dotted with the displacement, uh, from some start to some end. But then in the case of this gravitational force, I know that that force is negative mg y hat, dotted with your displacement, from some, some start to end. Then notice the masses cancel, and you're left with uh, just the dot product of y hat with dr. So then, it, it looks, and the negatives cancel as well. So then we create some integral from start to end of. Uh, actually, maybe I will. I'm going to keep the outer negative sign. So I'm just going to let the masses cancel, and I'm going to write this as negative g y hat, I should have just done this to start with, uh, times dr. But then that thing in parentheses, notice, is what I called the vector g above. So then this is negative from start to end of g hat, sorry, g, not, not necessarily unit vector, times dr. So at the end of the day, um, some delta V, how does V change, the potential change? It looks like it's equal to negative the integral of this vector G dotted dr from your kind of starting point to your end point. And in this case, G is a constant. So then this ends up just being negative G dotted with delta R for your displacement, your net displacement. So there is a connection right, between V and in this case just the agent, um, which we kind of like we more or less kind of encapsulated with this lowercase g vector. Since it's also defined uh, based on U, V is also defined up to an arbitrary reference point, up to or it's up defined up to some arbitrary constant.
So similarly, if we wanted to, we could define V as, um, well, we essentially, I already essentially did this, right? We have, we define delta V here as negative one over M times the work. And remember for potential energy, we essentially said, we're gonna let the potential energy be zero at the reference point and then start the integral at the reference point and go out to some arbitrary point. So we can do the same thing and define this as negative one over m, the integral of from some reference point to your point of interest of f dot dr. Or in this case, v is uh, for, for gravity, right, negative g dot dr from some reference point to your point of interest. Which again, notice if you are, uh, if you take g to be a constant, uh, you just get back what we had above, you know, g times y. If you go from say zero to some point above y. So again, where the you could define a potential energy function by do, integrating forces, uh, you can define this potential by integrating the agent, you know, vector, right? You know, that, uh, in this case, G. And it's, in this case, they're kind of encapsulating very, very similar information, saying something about the direction of the force. Um, but for V, it doesn't give you the force, but it gives you kind of the agent, and then you just have to multiply by M to turn it into a force. The changes in V say the same thing as the changes in U did, you know, U going from high to low means that V going from high to low also means, you know, corresponds to the thing speeding up, for example. If you went from low to high, that would be slowing down. And similarly, where I'm going the wrong order of the page here, but, you know, just like how uh, here's an integral that gives me G, you know, give me G and I will integrate it to get V. Similarly, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, you could then get G back uh, by taking a derivative of this expression. Uh, so I guess then this would also say that, you know, also looks like the vector G is going to be defined to be, in this case, negative the gradient of V in this example. Again, very similar to the potential energy. It might seem like I don't know why we've just spent 30 minutes on this when it seems like it's saying the exact same thing, except we just divided by the mass. Um, again, right, the idea is that we're kind of trying to separate object from agent, because then when we get to charges in one minute, right, since the charge that's, you know, moving around in an electric field, the charge can be positive or negative. Uh, so that just adds another complication to things where I might be able to, I can state something very unambiguously in terms of potential, and then I just have to bring in the, when I bring in the charge, which could be positive or negative, I just have to remember how the rules flip, you know, for certain, for certain things. All right. Um, I guess the only last example I'll give with gravity um, is what about for a point particle? Uh, so for a point particle, where then F, remember, was negative G, lowercase m, uppercase m, over the distance between them squared, and it points in this direction r hat, or again this vector r is defined to kind of point, and this would be the force kind of on little m from big M. Remember we define this as r points uh, to little m from big M. And then that overall negative sign makes it an attractive force. In this case, I could write it in terms of an object and an agent. I could write this as little m is the force on little m from big M. So this is little m times g big M. I'll just write it as r squared r hat. I could define that thing in parentheses as my little g. In this case, it's not a constant like it was in the previous example. 
but nonetheless that is still kind of capturing the agent part and then there's the object that is experiencing that force as a result. So, um, no, no, I want to do the integral, uh, but if, you're, if you try doing this on your own, the potential as a result ends up being G big M over R. And you could try for yourself and see that, um, well, first we could try drawing some equipotential surfaces. Remember this, dis this R is the distance between the two points. So if I put big M here, yeah, it might be that this is supposed to be a circle, right? That might correspond to, you know, one value of V. Uh, maybe this is, maybe it's like V equals, well, let me draw three surfaces. We draw three surfaces that get more and more spread out. So then there's this V, and then the next V, and draw way more spread out from the others, not uniformly spaced. This might be the case where this is V equals negative 10, where this is negative 20, where this is negative 30. They become more and more spaced out as you go, where you try to find every location where v equals negative 10, uh, and that will essentially that will essentially draw a circle, since this formula depends only on the kind of distance you are away from it, no sense of direction. Uh, so that's a circle or a sphere in 3D. Uh, but since there's this one over r, the value of v does change as one over r. Uh, I keep drawing it like this, I actually should draw it like this, right? Since it's an overall negative, it kind of goes from negative infinity when r equals zero and comes up and plateaus or asymptotes to zero. So then the potential surfaces are, you know, become more and more spread out if I were to draw them, you know, equal delta v. And the fact that they're negative doesn't matter. Because again, if I go from, say, this point to this point, I go from negative 10 to negative 20. Final is negative 20, initial is negative 10, negative 20 minus negative 10 is negative 10. So as I go from negative 10 to negative 20, my potential goes down, uh, you know, negative 10 to negative 20, it's getting you know, smaller or more negative, um, which we said then corresponds to an object speeding up. And if you think of this as gravity, you know, put make M the sun, uh, you know, if something pulls, you know, the sun pulls something in, and indeed it speeds up. So the fact that V is negative, just like potential energy, the fact that, you know, negative numbers don't, you know, who cares? You could always change your constant, right? Since you have a, a arbitrary constant you can change things to, you could make it everything positive if you wanted. Uh, but in this case, um, Negatives, negatives are okay. All right, so now let's actually connect this to electric fields. So now for charges. Moving through an external electric field. To connect the analogy here, kind of the connection is that everything we said above about little m is going to be replaced by q. And everything we said above about the vector g, we're going to be able to replace with the electric field E. And then essentially everything works out. It's be exactly the same. But now perhaps, hopefully, it's not as abstract seeming as it definitely was for me when this idea was first introduced. And we want a simple example to anchor ourselves. So where the simple example for gravity is a constant gravitational field, why not use a constant electric field? So let's have two plates, one that has a positive 
charge density sigma, and the other one has a negative charge density sigma. We know then that that creates a uniform electric field in between the two plates that goes from left to right, where the electric field in this case then is sigma over epsilon naught, um, and it points to the right, which we'll call the x direction. I'll define that to be the positive direction. So that if you have some positive charge Q, it will feel a force pointing to the right. If it was released from rest or, um, well, nonetheless, it will always accelerate to the right, which might mean speeding up uh, if it was starting from rest or maybe it's moving up and then it'll sort of veer to the right, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, and just, again, these examples, I'm not highlighting them, but just so that we're saying to anchor ourselves with. We could go through the integral, and maybe I'll have you do that on a sheet in class, for what the potential energy is for this case. Um, and again, you could look at what that integral is. Instead of a one-dimensional integral over y, you know, one's the integral over x, this ends up being negative q sigma over epsilon naught all multiplied by x. Or here I've defined the left plate as x equals zero, uh, which is also where I'm going to state that the potential energy is zero, since I'm free to choose that. Um, yeah, so now let's actually define what we're going to need for class. Let us define the electric potential which I will from here on out just call it potential as V equals and again with the idea of I want to take the potential energy and I want to essentially divide away the object so I'm only thinking about the agent the electric field in this case I'm going to define it as not U divided by M but as U divided by Q the units of potential as then looks like it's going to be joules per coulomb, which we give it its own unit and call this volt or volts. Uh, and we, we again use the letter V. V is getting a lot of use uh, in this particular chapter. So here we've defined electric potential with units of volts. As the Potential energy per charge, or if you want to think of it as spe a specific energy, um, but again, let's think of it as, you know, this is capturing the agent. So then in our example above, it looks like V for the two plates is going to then be, again, U divided by Q. But you notice I have not said anything about whether Q is positive or negative. Now obviously if Q is positive, it will feel force to the right, and it's negative if you feel force to the left. But the expression I wrote above for U did not take into account whether Q is positive or negative. So then U, or V rather, then looks like it's just negative sigma over epsilon naught multiplied by X. And it's some constant function that as X gets bigger, as you move to the right, V gets smaller. And negative, but again, doesn't matter. Negative signs don't matter at all. So then, this is a again a scalar field. Um, about the agent that can act on Q. By the definition I highlighted then u equals looks like q divided by v um, which then implies that again trying to connect it back to meaningful things the change in potential energy then is going to be q times the change in v
but since the change in potential energy is negative the change in the kinetic energy, that then also implies that the change in an object's kinetic energy is negative Q times the change in delta V. Again, notice it was exact, this is exactly what we wrote down before, but wherever there's an M, we wrote Q. So again, I can take these plates And I can again define equipotential surfaces. The left plate might be where V equals zero. Maybe this is where V is negative 10 volts. Maybe this is where V is negative 20 volts. This is where V equals negative 30 volts based on the formula that I had, which is just specific to this thing. Um, again, I'm only highlighting things that are generally true, not just true for the plate. So again, we should do a sanity check. Well, I guess before the sanity check, notice that, if, again, if I were to draw the electric field again, it's pointing in this direction, and notice that V, or these equipotential surfaces, are perpendicular to the electric field just how before it was perpendicular to that G vector. So again, by looking at the direction perpendicular to the potential surfaces, you are saying something about the direction of the electric field. I should write that down before we just do the sanity check. Um, so I guess I'll just say by a similar argument from before, uh, V equals constant surfaces, again, which we would call V equipotentials, um, are perpendicular to the electric field at, that, at those points. Um, and now let's do the sanity check so we can we can see whether you know what direction we should draw the electric field. Well, no, because we can see from the picture. Before we said that the vector g, you know, when we drew this, yeah, you know, pointed in a direction that went from high to low v. And if you do look here, notice. Um, it's exactly the same. You know, high V to lower V, which in this case, zero is the biggest number, and then it gets smaller and smaller. So V at those points, uh, pointing from high V to low V. Great. Now, sanity check, which we kind of are, have already been walking through. Right, suppose you release a proton from rest. Release proton from rest um, at left plate. We know it should then accelerate and move to the right plate. Um, so if it moves to the, the right plate, we should make a sanity check that, indeed, it will speed up in the, in the process. Well, in this case, then, it seems like delta V is going to be v right minus v left, so because n minus start, so that looks like it's negative 30 volts minus 0 volts, or negative 30 volts. It's the overall change in delta v, um, such that then the change in kinetic energy is negative q delta v, or that's 
negative positive E times negative 30 volts, which then looks like it's just 30 times E, whatever that number is, in joules, which is positive, right? That's greater than zero. So that checks out. The thing speeds up. Now what if I, maybe we'll call this sanity two. What if I release an electron at the right plate. If I release an electron at the right plate, we know it's going to move left and it should speed up. So now what's going on? Well, here is now where it gets a little bit more complicated compared to gravity, where for the gravity case, it seems like you always went from high potential energy to low potential energy, or from high potential to low potential. They were essentially saying the same, they had the same trends. And when Q was positive, it looks like, again, it seems like a positive charge goes from high V to low V. But now delta V, which is V left minus V right, and minus start, is uh, zero volts minus negative 30 volts or that this is just 30 volts positive 30 volts but then the change in kinetic energy which is negative Q delta V looks like it's negative then Q is negative E and then delta V is 30 volts again this thing looks like it's 30 volts uh, 30 times E, the negatives cancel. So it looks like this is negative, or sorry, 30 E then joules, which is again, greater than zero. Okay, that checks out. But notice the delta was different. Negative charges want to go from low potential to high potential, where positive charges went from high potential to low potential. So there is a, um, Essentially, uh, this is something that you just have to remember, um, which is why I feel like this is challenging when it's taught uh, you know, without kind of an, an anchoring example. So uh, for positive charge, um, the thing speeds up when you go high V to low V, which also is the same trend of going from high U to low U. Um, but what about potential energy in this case? In this case, the potential energy it depending on X. Well, in this case, um, all right, notice V does not care at all whether or not Q is positive or negative. Again, just re-emphasizing re that again. Uh, but then I'll let you think about kind of what's flipped and what's not flipped for potential energy. We're gonna wanna fill out a table in class you know, for all these trends. All right, for Q uh, less than zero, change in kinetic energy is positive, when you go, it looks like you went from low V to high V. And how does kinetic, and what about kinetic energy in that case? Or sorry, potential energy. Well, potential energy, you have to be careful because there's a Q in there as well. So if Q is negative, that flips this entire thing around. But then the delta right, might also take it into account. So we're gonna leave that as an exercise. Uh, that we will get in class. Let's see. Let's see what you know. Anything I can highlight here? Um, let's see. Uh, e points from high V to low V. That's good. And then we did just some sanity checks, I guess. So, okay. 
let me write down two formulas and then I did have another example, but I think I will call it there. And then we will just work through lots and lots of examples in class. Again, if, I, if you give me a force, I can calculate potential energy. Similarly, if you give me an agent, which in the case of the electric field, presumably then I could calculate the potential. And it's the same sort of proof, right? But instead of 1 over m times delta u, we have the delta v is defined as 1 over q. Uh, so um, I guess I'll just write it out. Equals negative 1 over q, the integral of the work done by the, that force for some starting point to some end point. But now we have to bring in what is force um, in this case. For some electric field, we know the force is Q times the electric field. And once again, notice that the charges cancel. So then we have delta V is equal to negative an integral of the electric field over your displacement from some start point to some end point. And when the electric field is constant, then that just becomes that. Since it, since it again, is defined in terms of the potential energy, this is also defined up to an arbitrary reference point. So again, by similar arguments, you can define V to be negative, this integral, but from some reference point to some point of interest of E dot dr. And then similarly, if I want to then get E back, looks like again, this vector E is equal to negative the gradient of V, which is the same as what we had written down before. And it's exactly the same because again, or before the mass is canceled here, the um, charge is canceled. And then I guess I, I was going to do the point charge again and then do an example with a battery. But since we are already at time, um, I think I'll leave it there. So this is a lot. This is a lot. So if we can anchor ourselves with this gravity example, and thinking about what's going on as potential changes, we can connect that to meaningful things by what's highlighted here. So that when we throw in charge, we're really doing the same sort of arguments, except sometimes you know there's a the charge is negative, sometimes it's positive. But this then is allowing us to again study the agent of this force, um, so that when we put any charge in between these plates, um, we can still get the same sort of out, you know information. Uh, but we're not forced to commit to what the exact charge is between the plates that we're you know, trying to move around. Again, because this kind of just lets you focus on the electric field itself. Um, okay, yeah, and these two expressions, um, I think we won't do to, you know, the, in our next class, but we'll save that for another class. So maybe I will make a small video for our you know, next meeting, but it will be just maybe you know, one or two more examples.